Welcome to the Functional Health Coaching Show, where we are here to support and answer your questions so that you can help people on a deeper level, get real results, and grow your health coaching business. Do you have questions you want to ask live on the show? You can call in every Friday at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time to 1-347-637-1378. Are you looking to increase your credibility and grow your health coaching business using functional lab testing and data-driven protocols so that you can confidently solve health issues? Well, we have the course for you. Go to fdn.today slash show to learn more and sign up today. Okay, let's join today's episode. Well, hey guys, happy Friday to you. You've joined us for the Functional Health Coaching Show. I'm your host, Brandon Molay. Missed you guys last week. I uh, always look forward to meeting with you guys, but I was traveling. So, But back again this week to talk with you guys and give you some support, however that you need that. As a, a graduate of the FDN course, a trainee, uh, if you're thinking about taking the course, the good show to watch, to get a feel, listen to, listen to rather. Uh, maybe we'll do it with Facebook is for watching, right? So we're talking today uh, to get a feel for what we do at FDN and the organization the training, the certification course, get a feel for who we are. Um, I've been a FTM practitioner for 10 years and uh, helping with the course, doing mentoring and this call for about five years. Uh, enjoy every minute of that. Um, probably have our founder and leader on Reed Davis today with us as well. I want to answer some questions for you guys. That's what we do most of the times on these calls. We do have some special guests from time to time, but mostly we're here to answer questions and give you support. So, because of that, it's a, it's a live call, and you can call in and ask a question, and we'd love to hear from you. Number is 347-637-1378. Again, 347-637-1378. You can hit one on the keypad. That'll bring you on live to the call. You can ask your question or questions, or just say hello. We're fine with a comment, too, if you want to add to the conversation, you want to add to one of our answers or or your experience. We'd love to hear that also. So I'd love to hear from you guys, no matter where you are, are in the journey. Uh, a lot of you guys are lining up there on the switchboard. Thanks for doing that and tuning in live with us today. Um, if, you, if you have a question, one on the keypad will get your hand to be raised, and I'll see you, and I'll bring you on, and we can talk a little bit. Well, it is March 13th, 2020. Um, This isn't going to be a news broadcast, but lots of interesting things going on in the world um, with um, with viruses and whatnot and and responses to viruses. So hopefully everybody is is well and and doing good and um, processing through some of those things. I don't have an official statement for FTN on that. Uh, Reed might have something more to say on that, but you guys have uh, enough information, I think, that's that's out there. But... um, Best thing is to right not to get into fear and not to panic and uh, uh, we know what to do to keep keep our bodies healthy and um, you know we wish everybody the best with all the ramifications from all the decisions being made regarding this but we're going to talk uh, other aspects of health probably today so uh, but if you want to ask about the coronavirus I'll I'll try to give you some in, in information about that not an expert on things but um, we do know how to strengthen the immune system help uh, keep a person strong so. Uh, that's just fine. So, again, March 13th, 2020. Uh, a few announcements here. Uh, I've got um, just a reminder about the FTN conference. So, um, that's in October. So, I don't expect anything to change with that. Um, definitely still make plans. We're booking our flights here um, just uh, yesterday um, to head out to the FTN conference. So, uh, we'll do it again for a third year in a row in San Diego. Biggest gathering of FTM practitioners uh, in the, during the year. We have other events that we go to. We have a booth or we're sponsoring something or we're just speaking at, but those are small compared to the FTN conference. So um, several hundred FTN practitioners gathered together and learning and talking with each other and learning from each other and learning from speakers, uh, networking, um, just making connections. You know, there's, it's people. That's uh, the answer to your problems uh, is probably going to lie in a person, right? So being in proximity, talking with other people, um, learning different things, uh, being inspired, you know, wherever you're at in the journey of a practitioner or a trainee, it's good to be around other people that are of like mind. It's a pretty amazing process. So 
That is October uh, 23rd through the 25th there. You can go to fdnconference.com, check out the uh, information there as we solidify more and more speakers. Um, be lots of vendors, lots of speakers, um, lots of opportunities just to hang out, have a lot of fun. Um, we like to do that in FDN land as well. So always want to keep that front of your mind, guys. Um, awesome thing to do. Look forward to um, sunny San Diego there in October. So check that out. Um, lots of different speakers on lately with AFDNP. Um, we've tried to really just in the process just how everything's been going. A um, lot more visibility as far as uh, videos go on Facebook and um, just trying to be out there and be a little more connected with you guys with the changes with, with the course, things going on there. I uh, want to be as transparent as possible let you know as uh, as things develop and I've uh, been trying to do that. So I, I like that. Um, I've been on some of those calls. Of course, we do this Friday call every week, but um, if you want to see what things are going on, probably the best place is to look on some of the Facebook pages um, to let uh, updates on um, course as we're rearranging some things there. But we had a lot of speakers, a lot of good training still. Um, life goes on. People still need help and training needs to continue. So uh, make sure you check that out um, for any other announcements, um, some summits and things going on as well. Uh, good things to check out. And then uh, I guess I'm going to go to graduates now. So um, like I said, Reed, Reed's probably going to be on today. If not, it's okay. I'll talk with you guys alone and be happy to, to answer some questions and just be with you guys again on a Friday afternoon. Um, graduates. So I'm not sure that the graduate from last week was named off, uh, acknowledged, but I'll go ahead and do that again. Double is just fine. So we'll have two graduates this week uh, in the course we want to uh, acknowledge and celebrate and cheer on. Um, so glad to get to uh, be one of the final steps in the certification process where I get to go through um, our verbal final. Um, another practical, we have many practicals in the course. Um, those help you to practice what you're learning, right? So you can answer questions, multiple choice questions, and essay questions. You can do those things well, but if you can't communicate with another person when it comes to their health and things that we do, um, it's not going to, it's just impossible. You've got to be able to do that, right? So doing those practicals allows you to practice that, work out some of the kinks, get better and better, find out where you have your strengths, where you have some weaknesses that you want to shore up. So practicals are a big part of what we do uh, in the course. And of course, I get to do that last verbal final uh, practical there and have a great time with that. It's bringing together all the things that you're learning, tie up some loose ends, and then, of course, celebrate when you when you pass and you get to be certified as a practitioner. And we don't hold you back from going out there and helping people. It's a very quick process from, hey, congratulations, you've you made it, uh, to running labs and working with people. And most people have clients waiting to test. Either they've got an established practice where they have people that uh, want to test um, or they've already been out there actively. I think it's just fine to do this marketing their business already, talking about what they do. They're already out there doing that. So people are just waiting to run labs and, and to be helped. Um, I've had a lot of free consultations um, last few weeks here. People are really um, kicking into gear again. So um, And we're just a beacon of light to a whole lot of folks that don't have hope um, or can't seem to figure out the issues. And um, I get uh, often on my contact form on my personal website there, um, something to the effect of at the end, please help me. And uh, boy, that just, that toes at my heart, probably does you guys too. So if there's desire and there's a will, um, there's a way and there's answers. And that's what we get to provide as practitioners. So that gets you excited, gets you up in the morning. It does for me. Who do I get to, to impact their life today? And that's not just a cliche. That is truth of, of what we get to do. So that's where our two graduates here, Grace and Connie, are heading into here um, uh, as days to come here. Uh, so last week was Grace Soma from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, just a few miles from where my where my dad's family's from. Um, so we want to say congratulations to Grace also from last week, if we didn't get to say it um, uh, last week. And then this week... Um, you guys know her probably pretty well. She's been around FTN for a little while, but very active at different events and on Facebook pages and uh, just making her presence known and being a, definitely a light to a lot of folks out there. That's Connie Rubin from Oregon. So, uh, Grace, Connie, congratulations to you. 
We're so proud of you. Awesome job. Um, glad to have you as part of the FDN family. So tremendous. And I'll say good job. All right. So um, I think that's the big things I wanted to mention there. So um, I'm going to open up the next 45 minutes or so um, to questions. Uh, pulled some from Facebook pages. Some of you guys have sent in, so I'll go through some of those too. But definitely we'll open it up to live calls at this time. So if you guys want to call in and talk, if you're listening maybe on Blog Talk, want to dial in, you have to dial in. Uh, so pick up your phone, 347 637 one three seven eight is that number and again hit one on your keypad i'll see that you want to come on and you're welcome to ask a question and get an answer all right so i've got the first one here i've got 703 area code 703 what's your name there uh hello is this me the 703 uh, this is Gracia. yes that's you Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I said maybe there's another 703. All right. Uh, hello, <laughs> oh, gotcha. Brandon. I hope I'm pronouncing hey. your name correctly. Um, yes. Again, this is Gracia, and uh, thank you for everything you're doing. We really enjoy, and we take a lot of uh, advantage of everything all of you guys are providing to us. Um, let's go to my question, and I'd like to hear uh, your experience and your wisdom on this. Um, there are some people that uh, they keep um, eating wheat and gluten, and uh, when I recommend them not to do that, uh, they tell me that although they have uh, some uh, disease, some pathologies, they say that uh, they were tested and uh, um, they, don't, they are not sensitive to gluten or to wheat. So what would you recommend me? How can I approach them? How can I try to explain them not to do that? Thank you. Mm, good question there. Interesting one there. Uh, I think we've all uh, been there a little bit. But, yeah, good to hear from you, Grazia. Thanks for, for calling in. So, um, okay, so um, scenario there would be that um, whatever testing they've done, um, is not showing reactivity to gluten, but I guess you're saying that just probably statistically, it may be good practice pulling out gluten out of their diets going to be a recommendation. Is that sort of the question? Yeah, because, for example, as you know, even if they are not uh, sensitive to gluten or to wheat, especially I have problems with wheat, people say, oh, but I'm not sensitive to wheat. Um, but uh, I try to explain them the Vili story, uh, you know, uh, intestinal permeability and stuff like that, that wheat and gluten <clears throat> cause. But besides that, I don't know what to say. Of course, I, I cannot... If the person is not ready, I cannot convince them. And, and I'm not trying to convince. I'm trying to help them not to have uh, more health issues. Uh, but again, right. uh, besides saying, okay, when you're going to get sicker, then come back to me, which is quite rude, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else to say. <laughs> gotcha. Well, I, I don't know. I think I would... My immediate reaction there is I think it sort of falls in with any other um, stressor on the body. Now, it could be a really big one that's making a big difference. You feel like that it is. But, um, you know, not every client is going to be 100% compliant um, all the time. Um, mm -hmm. So if that's still something they keep in their diet but they're doing everything else really well, I think mm -hmm. they're probably going to see improvement. So it's something where you as a practitioner, the way you want to operate. So, um you know, I'm not going to, you know, like you said, just kick them out as a client because they won't do that one thing. Some mm -hmm. people might want to draw that hard line and work that way. Mm -hmm. I can I can see that. So <clears throat> it's also something where I, sometimes I'll let that be a next phase for people. So if they're doing everything else really well, many times anything, like let's say maybe they're a smoker you know, or maybe they drink real often too much alcohol. Um, some of those things are just self-medication. And so mm -hmm. I'm trusting that by doing a protocol, that's just going to, the health is going to increase and it's going to drive out some of those bad behaviors. Either it's not congruent with their approach, what they're trying to accomplish, uh, or physiologically, they don't need the supposed benefit they feel like they're getting from that food. So it could be something that is, okay, it's one of the last things that finally goes. 
um, if, again, you want to work like that. Now, if Reed were on here, he probably would uh, be more of the line like say, hey, if you eat this food, if you choose to eat this, I'm not going to work with you. You know, you could draw that hard line. Um, so especially if you have lab testing, um, you know, I could say, yeah, draw that hard line. Um, if okay. you don't have lab testing or they have testing that shows they're not reactive, maybe you can make a compromise there and say, hey, would you go gluten-free for, you know, two weeks or three weeks? Let's see how you feel. I think that can apply to any foods, right, anything. Maybe just pull out a possible trigger food for that person and just mm-hmm. note how they're feeling. Hopefully, the symptoms will improve, and that will encourage them to want to be off of that. Um, but you can't do it for them. You can't want it more than they want it. Yeah, I, I understand uh, the story of the horse, right, and the water. Um, <laughs> right. Besides that, for example, people with autoimmunity, and uh, in this case, the symptoms are not immediate. Immediate. Oh, I mean, immediate, however you say it. <laughs> you know, I have an accent. I'm not uh, Native American, let's say. Um, I'm Italian. And um, and they don't see immediate, uh, uh, now I pronounce it properly, um, results. Uh, mm-hmm. So I would think to propose them at least for three months to be gluten-free and wheat-free, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. Uh, mm-hmm. And, of course, that includes oats because a lot of people think that oats are, are are fine because they think that they are gluten-free. Well, they are not because they contain gliadin, and gliadin is a type of gluten, right? Yeah, so if you have an auto, a diagnosed autoimmune condition from the doctor, mm-hmm. I'd say mm-hmm. that would be hopefully a lot more weight to say, okay, gluten-free is probably where you're going to go if somebody is dealing with autoimmunity, then it's 100%, no matter what Mm -hmm. any test shows, really, Mm -hmm. gluten-free and dairy-free, as far as what I would recommend to a client. Let's just, let's give your body, I I, I approach it this way, just let's give your body every chance we can for it to Mm -hmm. function well. Why wouldn't you? Why why are you coming to me? Why are you spending this money? So I would, I'd put put it that way. If you want to feel better, let's just do this. So uh, yeah, that's, that's a tough one there. Um, ho- hopefully, we don't deal with too much, I- too many issues with client compliance. That can be very, very frustrating um, for you, I think, as a practitioner. Um, uh, and hopefully, hopefully, we can vet those people, you know, before they start working with us. They sort of know what's expected of, of them, um, being yeah. a client of yours. Um, uh, mm-hmm. So maybe establish those things early on. But at the same time, I'm not a person who's just going to totally give up on that person. Maybe they'll come around. Uh, maybe they need some education. Maybe you can share some, some, some videos or some materials with them that they might want to read and show that, hey, statistically, here's what we see. Um, yeah, I think there's different ways you could handle it. All right. Thank you so very much for your time and for your wisdom yeah. and uh, everything mm-hmm. you provided to me. I don't want to take much more of your time because I'm sure other people are waiting. Have a great day. Thank you. And- <laughs> Thanks, Wonderful Scott. So good to hear from you. Appreciate the call in. You too. Very good. Yeah, patient compliance that's, or client compliance, that can be a, a tough one sometimes. Hopefully those are well established. And um, I just had a conversation this morning with the person that's uh, about to come on and, and work with me. And um, she was pretty open about that. She said, you know, I, I, I know things I need to be doing. And it's usually a question I'll ask folks. I'll say, hey, you know, is the timing right? Are you really ready to do this? If I ask you to do, you know, I'll give a list of a few things to do. Is that something you can do? You know, how motivated is that person? You ask those questions there on a scale of, of one to ten. You know, how motivated are you? Because I need, I only work with nines and tens. You have to be to that point. Um, if they're not at that level, it's very frustrating. It's very hard. I, I think it's almost a disservice, really, to bring somebody on to work with you that you know is at a real low level um, as far as um, confidence or desire to to make a change that's just not going to fit. But but she was being um, uh, transparent with me about, you know, uh, I, I've been gluten-free before. I know it helped um, just kind of in a situation where I, I, I know probably what I need to do, but I also need the information the lab testing is going to give me with this. And um, a couple of points I, I made to her was that, hey, you know, you're first of all, you're investing financially um, into working with me and working into your health. And it's not like you're going to spend just $200. You're investing substantially. So money has a bit of a, a, a pull, right? And then, of course, lab testing. 
right? The numbers on paper, there's something in a person's head that can click. Oh, wow. Okay. This is really what I need to do. Oh, it's not just maybe, you know, some marker for gluten, for example. It could be, okay, that's kicked up your immune system. That's caused some leaky gut that's going on. That's caused an inflammatory response here. I'm seeing it throughout. Here's the ripple effect from you eating that particular food. And maybe that's enough weight to push that person. Um, I think you can also talk to a person about uh, the psychological side of things, the uh, the why before the how is a way I've heard it phrased before. So the how, we have no problem lining that out for people, right? That's easy. How do you get healthier? How do you build health in the body? Here's the how, the why. Go back to the why. I ask that on my intake forms. Why are you doing this? How is this holding you back in life? You're going to have that conversation in the beginning, but I have them write it down as well. And sometimes I'll go back to that. So you just said that, you know, you are missing days of work uh, because you're sick and you can't get to the level that you want to get to. And that's very frustrating to you. And you're not there for your family like you want to. And you're irritable and you can't enjoy a meal or whatever their motivations are. That's really what the business that we're in is trying to help them achieve those goals. Ill health happens to be in the way of that. So we're trying to help them with that part of it. So, you know, everything a person is going to do directly or indirectly is going to be tied to the level of health, period. And so it's always a good um, thing to be focusing on working on. So investment of money is one motivating factor. Second thing is actual numbers on paper and you weaving that story together of the, of the connecting of the dots and clinical correlation. Super, super powerful things. You use those tools every single time that you can during a session. Those two things. And then hopefully, um, your programs we've put together as a practitioner, you have some sort of regular check-in and some coaching sessions, if you want to call it that, where you're checking in with that person on a regular basis. I've done the opposite. I've done it where I'm very, very hands-off. Results aren't as good, right? Because first of all, there's a level of accountability. We all need that. Um, I think really, I think my wife provides that for me uh, quite a bit. We all both keep each other in check. Um, I think um, seeing my daughter every day provides some level of accountability. Um, seeing my clients every day is some level of accountability for me. So I don't want to be tired or sick or in a bad mood um, for any of those people in my life. So there's an accountability side of that that I'm trying to be, and this is for other people's benefit as well as mine. So there's an accountability that comes with coaching. Uh, regular meetups I do every two weeks. That's a good uh, sweet spot for me every two weeks. Um, so you have the accountability. You also have the support, right? You know, things things can get tough. Things can get mentally tough. Things can be um, a challenge where there's, where there's life happens, right? So uh, when a person's working with you, you can't guarantee that nothing stressful in life is going to occur. Nobody's going to die. No jobs are going to be lost. No viruses are going to sweep the nation, whatever. You can't guarantee those things. So, But you can be there for that person, help them through those rough points. And it's okay. We can be a friend in a way or a, a counselor in a way or just um, a listening ear uh, for folks because the mental emotional is definitely tied in with health, right? You can't escape that also. So there's support that way. And I guess the final thing I think that makes the difference there for folks is the continuous course correction. Um, how many people do you know have get, got to a point with their health where we were along pretty good, but they get some kind of roadblock, whatever it is, a mental block, a biochemical one, whatever way, some kind of block, and they either want to lay down and quit um, or don't know how to get past that or are so down into it that they can't rise above it, look at it objectively and figure out what to do. Well, that's what we get to do. I think it's one of the big things that we do um, as far as practitioners go that give us such good results is that we lock arms with that person and figure out whatever it is to get over that hump, to get to that next level. Because if they were on their own and hit that wall, they would just lay down and that would have been it. And they wouldn't have gone any further and probably started to regress and then beat themselves up and feel bad about how far they got, and how far they've lost. So we're playing that role as well. Um, I feel like it's critical. We've added more and more coaching um, and uh, case management to the course because of that aspect of things. You know, um, yeah, we used to be mostly a course just on how to interpret labs and put together a good dress protocol. But it takes some more than that for a lot of people, 
right? So um, there's the mental emotional side of, of those things. Um, so that's usually what I talk about with folks that are um, kind of on the fence, but most of the time we don't even get to that part of the conversation if they're not, I can tell, already committed, understanding what we do. But everybody needs to be heard, go through their story, ask those eight questions, and uh, make sure that person is going to be a good fit to work with you and that you can help them and that everybody's going to be mutually benefited from the relationship. That's what you want, right? It's not just, oh, I got a client, but they didn't fall through with it. Who cares? I hate that big time. I think you guys probably do too. Um, so we do everything we can to prevent that. We don't want to lose one. We want everybody to be as healthy as they possibly can and teach them how to fish instead of just giving them a fish and Hopefully those lessons you teach them will last a lifetime and, and feed over into their family's life. All right. Well, went off on a tangent there. Hopefully that was helpful, but some thoughts there on my mind this morning with that. But, boy, a lot of you guys are on the line, but um, no hands raised. So I may go with a written-in question here unless you guys want to jump on here. Got about 30 minutes left in the call today, so plenty of time for some questions. So. I'm going to pick one off the list, and we'll talk a little bit here. So um, here's one I wanted to go through. All right, so uh, a little bit in the uh, case management side of things here. We could categorize it here also into supplementation, part of our dress protocol, right? Diet, rest, exercise, stress reduction, supplementation. I'll never forget that acronym, no matter (laughs) how long it's been. So, question here is, with all the supplements and antimicrobials recommended to take with meals and in between meals, can most be taken at the same time? Is there a sheet somewhere or checklist that puts this all together for us? Um, Or when you're trying to address hormone imbalance, gut dysbiosis, bug support, or should we put one together for our own clients? Um, And I list an example here of... Um, different supplements here that they had laid out for a client. So how do we navigate that? Um, Yeah, so timing logistics is important. Um, The 90-day protocol sheet, super handy. I like it because you really have a good list of all the things to choose from, uh, which is awesome. We want to have different options because we don't do cookie-cutter protocols, right? Yeah, there are some areas we're always going to cover with a person generally that you're going to be seeing based on lab work, but Every protocol of mine is is different. I don't think I've ever done, you know, copy or duplicate and here's your protocol. That just never happens because everybody's biochemically individual. Um, That's why we have such good results, right? So um, definitely there are going to to vary quite a bit from person to person. And that 90-day protocol sheet is nice because you use that as a memory jogger. So, okay, here's the areas I really need to focus on, making sure I'm hitting all the, the, the basic systems and components of the body to make sure everything is going to work um, as effectively as possible. Um, so that sheet's nice, but it can be a little bit overwhelming, even if you do hide the individual lines or rows and just show the supplements you want that person to take. So something I did uh, years ago personally, and I think I uploaded a base document for that within AFTMP, I think, documents there. So if you're a member of AFTMP, you can grab that. It's nothing fancy, but it does work. Um, I started doing a table um, that is based sort of on time of day. I felt like that was the most effective and helpful for people, especially if there's a lot of supplements or, you know, not every client comes to us with um, perfect focus and perfect brain function. It might be some brain fog. People forget about things. So um, putting it in a table there based on time of day, what allows you to do is to see whether there is some issue, some overlap. If you're saying, hey, I want you to take some biocidin and your support biotic uh, at the same time. Well, shoot, that's not going to work, right? Because you don't want to be killing off the good bacteria that you're putting in there. So that's a, a combination you don't want. Um, also, you want to factor in uh, a person's on prescription medication, right? So depending on what you have there, what you're recommending, what that medication is, some things don't need to be combined. I typically don't have people to combine prescriptions and supplements, even if I feel like they probably are safe, there won't be any you know, direct interaction. Try to keep those separated. So you want to be thinking about pretty much everything a person is putting in their mouth. That's what that chart does. And so it's um, very similar to what we teach in the course. You've got a column for sequence number, 
one through 10 or whatever you've got going there. Then you've got a column for the supplement name. And then you've got about eight places throughout the day where you can take supplements, right? So when you first get up with breakfast, in between breakfast and lunch, with lunch, between lunch and dinner, with dinner, before bed, maybe a few little ones you can, can stick in there somewhere. But you've got several spots where you can take supplements. Uh, and then finally, I put a column for notes. So when I start to lay that out, I'm looking at that person's day. So if this person's doing, I've had this often recently, a lot of people doing intermittent fasting. Okay, well, I can't load up a bunch of supplements at breakfast time because they're not eating any food. And some of these supplements that they say, you know, take with a meal, you don't, probably don't want to take them on an empty stomach because they could cause some stomach upset or something negative. So back to I'm thinking about everything that person is taking and consuming, putting in their mouth throughout the day. So when they're drinking their water, when they're eating their meals, um, how likely did they eat a late breakfast, an early breakfast, late dinner, early dinner? Did they eat a snack at nighttime? All these things you're sort of thinking about. Now, I try to put as much as I can on the client to think about, but I do like to lay that out and give that to the client as far as a, a protocol sheet goes. Um, so I've looked at it ahead of time. I've looked for the issues there that it might be coming. Um, you know, some things you want to uh, do on an empty stomach or some things on an empty stomach that really need to be all alone. So if you're doing Interface Plus, for example, that's one that needs to be all alone. Um, you can put some supplements with it, but it needs to be away from food and, you know, away from prescriptions. So you have to find a spot where you can fit that in there. Many times binders like GI Detox, other binders need to be away from everything, food, supplements, and prescriptions. And so you need to find those dedicated times where you take that. What that does for me also is allows me to prioritize the very most important things. But sometimes you put that puzzle together and it fits just great. It's like, okay, there's not too many, not a crazy amount of supplements, fits in real nicely. Okay, I like how this is, is, is coming together. Other times you'll find where it's like, wow, this beast puzzle piece it just won't fit. There's too many things going on here, too many supplements. I've got too much, um, you know, uh, here, this is overlapping this one. I shouldn't do that. It just becomes kind of difficult, and you're going to see that the problem is going to be a problem for your client. And we want to try to make things as as easy as you can. doesn't mean there's no work involved, but as easy as we can. Um, so in that case, I might do a fun exercise, and that is to prioritize supplementation. What can I take away? that won't affect the protocol of that results. Um, keeping in mind that it is about diet, rest, exercise, stress reduction, logistical um, time of day sheet together. Um, it's something, if you want to send that to the client, you could. If you want to use the 90-day protocol sheet, you can. But I think it's we need to think through that. That's what I do personally, and uh, people get that, understand that pretty well. So look for that document if you want to do something like that, create your own, I think, uh, it's just a table in Word, in a Word document turned landscape, long ways. Very, very basic, very simple. Um, and I do, I did make a little video, which I encourage you guys to make to save uh, save some time, but also it's a lot of advantages to a video. Uh, a video that accompanies that, that walks them through sequence and titration, right? That whole concept. Yes, you're going to need to hit that when you're going through that with the R&R. &R. Yeah, you want to remind them of that as you're meeting with them as they're working supplements in. But along with that protocol sheet, you could say, hey, here's a little video I want you to watch. Five minutes just talks about the need for supplements, how to use the sheet, how to think about sequence and titration, whatever important things you think that person needs to be aware of. Put that in the video. That way you can um, cover maybe in more detail because it takes more time. Um, gives them some homework to do. They're always, you know, you, you're trying to rewire some thinking. You're trying to establish some new habits, um, frequency of exposure to ideas. Um, that's part of that process. And so um, does it feel like you're thinking about your health a whole lot? Uh, yeah, it should, right? Because that's what it's going to take right now to make those changes. And all of a sudden, heard it many times before. Oh, well, yeah, I'm just kind of used to eating this way. The supplements, I, I know exactly when to take them. I'm much more thinking about hydration now. Exercise is just a, a part of my schedule. All of a sudden, you have this person that is now doing all the things they need to continue to maintain or improve their health over a lifetime. That's some success there. That's what we're 
our goal is. Like Grazia was talking about, we can't control that 100%, but at least we got to try to set them up for success, teach them kind of the goal that we're trying to get to. Okay, um, so that would be my answer, I suppose, on that question. Where was I? Okay, yeah, so... Um, so yeah, so there is some work that you need to do. Um, most labels will tell you on there, away from food, with food, um, or you can always post something up there individually. Um, but you need to learn, I very much believe in this, you need to know very well the supplements that you're recommending. You need to know the ingredients, where they're going to get those supplements, how to take those, uh, potential pitfalls they might feel experiencing some of those things. That will come sometime with experience, but if it takes a cheat sheet to begin with, you need to write those things down and get really good. Those are tools of your trade. So if you have a carpenter that doesn't know how to use a hammer, there's something wrong with that, right? He better have three cups of hammers that he can use uh, working on a project. It's a bad analogy, but you know what I mean. you got to know your tools. And if you don't know your tools, then I just don't think you're doing the due diligence. And um, I might call you a practitioner that's uh, a little bit lazy. So um, don't leave everything to your client. But the work is done by the client, too. So keep that balance, but know very well what you're recommending, why you're recommending those. Um, that's just part of what we're doing. That's what people are paying us for. Let's see. Okay, I think we answered that one. Um, yeah, so find out, learn the supplements, and you'll be in good shape. 20, 25 minutes or so left in the call. So if you guys want to jump on and ask a question, I see you guys out there. You can't hide from me. I can. <laughs> if you just want to listen, that's fine today, or just say hello. That's cool, too. Um, oh, hey, yeah, there's one. All right. All right, I got 306 area code. What's your name, 306? Hey, Brandon, it's Brandy. I thought I'd call in and help answer some questions with you today. Well, thank you. I thought that voice sounded familiar. Thank you, thank you. Hey, Brandy. <laughs> Welcome, Brandy. Everybody, Brandy Biscow. You know her. She's all over the place, and she's doing an amazing job. Um, with. <laughs> I don't know what you don't have your hands in there, Brandy, but thanks for being on the call with me. Awesome. Absolutely. Hey, did you want to add to the question there um, as far as uh, you know, logistics of supplementation, not wanting uh, the balance there? I don't know if you heard the question or not. I can repeat it. Sure, yeah. If you just want to repeat the question, then I can definitely give some insights into um, my experience with supplements. Gotcha. So this is a person that's putting together a protocol, and they're looking at all the different things they want to recommend, and then they're thinking about the timing of those. So, you know, some with meals, some in between meals. Um, how do we lay that out? Is there a sheet somewhere or a checklist that puts it all together for us? Um, do we put together one for our clients? Just, I guess, thoughts about logistics of, of what they're going to take and, and how often and what time of day. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's a struggle um, depending on the client that you work with, because some clients can get really overwhelmed with the amount of supplements that you recommend. So I always try to keep that in mind when I'm working with my clients, especially if I can tell from the beginning that they are somebody who's anxious and can get easily overwhelmed. So I create an Excel spreadsheet and I just have a column for upon waking, breakfast, between breakfast and lunch, lunch, between lunch and dinner, dinner and before bed. So I have a column for each one and then I'll add in each column for each supplement when I recommend that they take it with a note at the end, you know, something like biocidin, which, you know, you're supposed to take it before a meal um, and kind of let it sit in your mouth for a while before you have anything to eat or drink. So I'll add notes there. But one of the things that I mentioned to my clients is with the caveat of like, this is what I suggest, but don't get overwhelmed by it. If you have a day where you forget, don't freak out because you forgot. It's okay. Just take it when you remember. But this is ideally the, the best time to take the supplement and um, go slow. So like I'm sure you talked about, Brandon, is the titration process is really important. So um, titrating, going slow and, you know, if you do have a client that's really overwhelmed, see if you can pare down that recommendation list, the, the protocol, um, to like things that are absolutely necessary. And that might also help with some of the overwhelm and the logistics part. 
Very good. Great minds think alike. That was part of my answer, but I like that you talked about, you know, taking the pressure off there. You skip one here and there. It's not going to make or break the program. Um, it's something that takes a little bit of time to work in if you're not used to doing that. Um, I think I started with the process of supplements uh, early on, probably my early 20s. And it was something that, that uh, I don't know, I, I took to it pretty quickly because I knew they were helping because they were, the results reinforced the behavior. So it's something where, okay, it's odd to, for me at this point in the game, um, really not to take a supplement with a meal. It's just part of my day-to-day life. You know, usually there's something I'm going to be taking with my meals, and sometimes usually something when I first wake up and before bed. There's times I'm doing different things, depending on what I'm working through, if it's a, whatever kind of protocol I'm doing at the time. Um, so that's good. That's good. I do use that time of day sheet as well. I think it helps people out quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, I come at it from the perspective that, like, as a mom of four, I'm busy. So I know I forget, you know, unless I'm doing like a gut protocol where I'm like really strictly on it. There are other times when I'm not doing that with my day to day that I know I'm going to forget. And I just am honest with them and tell them that and say, it's okay. You know, it's, you don't have to be perfect with this, that it's still going to work. Yep. Yep. It's about reducing stress overall. So we, it's hard to reduce stress 100%. So if we're hitting at 85%, that's progress. So more than what they were doing. All right. Well, thanks. Um, all right. I have another hand raised here. So I'm going to go with 303 area code. Um, 303 there. What's your name, 303? Hey, it's Chris Wilson from Fort Worth, Texas. Hello there, Chris. How are you, man? I'm doing really well. Thank you. Hope you're doing well too. Yeah, doing good. What you got for us today? So I got two questions. The first is, uh, so we've been doing the Matula tea, me and my household for eradicating my wife's H. pylori. And for the last two nights, and I haven't done anything different in my diet or anything other than taking the Matula tea, but I've had gas and bloating at night and excessive gas like farting. (laughs) I hate to say that, but, um, and I'm, it just kind of came out of nowhere. So I don't know if it's because the tea is stirring things up, you know, and we haven't yet completed the tea protocol to move on to the next phase of my wife's parasite protocol. But I'm just curious if the tea is contributing to that or what's going on there. And then question two, when you get to it, or if you have time is just, so I have a private Facebook group that I'm trying to build relationships with people to turn into clients how do I properly gauge when I'm not like um, uh, just trying to act like I'm sell, sell, sell my services on there, but balance it properly? Do you have any tips or suggestions for that? Mm, cool. Cool. Okay. Good questions. Um, well, uh, on the Matula T side of things, glad you guys are, are doing that. Um, it's usually a pretty painless protocol when it comes to the Matula tea, but you can have some little things that do occur and blips in the road. Um, you know, with anything you're doing with supplementation there and also with diet, we're doing some pretty major remodeling. So there are some shifts and changes and adjustments that will occur um, during that. So it's kind of the, the healing crisis or die off some of the things that we call it. Um, I'd file this under probably that healing crisis um, category. Um, it's something where i Probably unless it's just something that is, you know, that you can't get through, I probably would push through it and see where it goes. You might just have to kind of um, burst through a barrier there and and get to the next phase of things with your gut. It's probably going to be pretty short-lived is my guess. Um, why exactly it's happening, I, I think it's possible you could be pushing some bacteria and it's migrating through the system there and it's hitting a, a different pocket when all your... 20, 25 feet of intestine there where it's maybe acting on some food that's there or adding some bacteria, just kind of a remodeling phase. I think I I use that analogy often with clients, especially with the gut, is if you're remodeling, you know, a room in your house or a house, um, you know, things get a little dusty, a little dirty in that process, no matter what you do. But you know that the long-term benefit and the final end result is going to be really awesome. So that remodeling process, and you want to minimize that. So 
there's a balance there also. So you don't want a person to be miserable during that uh, that process, but sometimes you do want to push through that. I think with Matula T, I would go ahead and push through. I wouldn't, you know, cut your doses down um, if you can help it. Um, if it gets, you know, worse where you can't uh, bear it, then or the people around you can't bear it, um, then maybe you want to cut back a little bit and uh, maybe do one dose a day and extend that out a little bit longer. I think that'd be okay short term um, to do that. So, um Brandy, any thoughts on Matula T? Yeah, um, I've actually noticed that with any H. pylori protocol, most of the time I do suggest Matula T, but that first week, a lot of people tend to have some discomfort. So sometimes it's nausea, sometimes it's changes in bowel movements, sometimes it's gas and bloating. And almost every time, I, I kind of just let my clients know that at the beginning, like expect to have a little bit of discomfort in that first week. But once you get past the first week, um, like you mentioned, Brendan, things start to kind of restructure themselves and, and your body starts to figure out what's going on. And a lot of those symptoms start to subside. So um, I've it, historically with my clients seen that that's pretty normal at the beginning um, when you're starting to work on H. pylori. Mm. Yeah, it doesn't want to go quietly, does it? H. pylori uh, can can be that way, but uh, boy, it's one that if I see it there and symptoms definitely are uh, clinically correlating, then um, we're going to go after that and make a big change. So, so hopefully you can make it through there, Chris. Um, and then on the Facebook uh, uh, private group thing uh, and turning those into clients, having balance there to it. I don't have a lot of experience personally doing that. I've kicked around the idea there before um, to do that. I think it's a cool way to engage and ask questions. And sometimes even in like Facebook Messenger, you start to have a little bit of a conversation on things. So um, it's kind of fun to do, um, uh, have that um, dynamic going there. Um, I, I think we all sort of deal with that um, as as business owners, uh, trying to find that balance between quality content and also letting people know that you've got something um, to share with them to sell. So, um, uh, Brandy, you probably have a better answer to this than I do, but one thing I will um, say here is that I, I think you'll sort of know when you've crossed that line a little bit based on reactions of people. And But I think at the same time, if if they know you, which is the whole point of any sort of mo- social media um activities or uh, uh, efforts or a Facebook page or a private group like this is to get a person to people to know you, um, who you are. So if they don't like you, they're not going to work with you anyway. And if they see that you're putting out there some solution to their problem and they get bothered by that, I probably don't want them as a client anyhow. So you you can't say the, the wrong thing to the right person in a way. So if they're a fit for you and they know you and they know your heart, Chris, and, and your abilities and they're, uh, you know, jibe with you and connect with you and resonate with you, um, then you'll get the people that you need to get. So there's a balance uh, for sure. But um, I, I think sometimes things just kind of happen like they need to and people get weeded out through that process, just you being you. Okay. I appreciate the answers. And yeah, I'm just kind of pushing through the maturity protocol and my new suggestion for the Facebook thing that I'll share that I'm going to try um, was creating very small YouTube videos or Facebook lives, like a minimum to three to four minutes, just kind of repurposing my wife's story through other um, either blogs or articles I've written and just kind of reading that off and then, you know, tying in the emotional side to that. And then just leaving a call to action with little bits and pieces of her story and how I've helped her along the progress. Uh, so people can connect that way. I'm going to try that and see how it goes. I um, wanted to share that just to see if anyone else could use that as a good idea or not. But thank you for the time, and I appreciate you guys as I, always. Yeah, man, you're, you're welcome. So um, I will I will put you on mute here. I'll add a little bit more to that there. Uh, I think Brendan said it before. I like is that you, um, you know, we're, we're fishing. Uh, we are, you know, we, we, because if a person, you know, a person can make some basic changes, right, and feel improvement, but we want people to, do the FDN to do to test to go through the process. Know it's going to be the quickest, best way to truly get down to those changes they really want to have. Um, so um, that's what we want, and we need to be, I think, obvious about that. Like, I need to talk with you. I need to have a one-on-one with you, and we need to go through and figure out what's going on with your body using testing. That's what we do. We don't need to apologize. A horse doesn't apologize for being a horse. FDN shouldn't apologize for being an FDN practitioner. We run labs. That's what we do. 
And so part of that's just stepping into who you are and what you've been trained to do because you know that it works. Um, so a little of that, but you are fishing, so you don't want to just keep throwing bait into the water. You want to have a hook on that as well. And that's okay to have. Um, I think it's a, a mental shift on what sales is. Sales is not trying to manipulate or cheat or persuade somebody. It's giving them a solution to the problem. And if the cost isn't too high and they feel like it balances out with the cost of the problem for them, then you just provide a solution. And the exchange for providing a solution is something monetary, some, something, something of value. It's just the extent it's commerce. That's just capitalism on a million different things you could call it. It's a fun process to me. Um, I have no problem. We do it all the time, right? I want to be warm today, so I'm paying the electric company <laughs> to put electricity or a gas company to put gas to my house so I can be warm. I'm not thinking, boy, these people are selling me on this stuff. You know, I'm trying to be persuaded. No, it's an obvious thing. This is so obvious. So you want the clients you work with it to be just an obvious conclusion that, yes, calling Chris and working with Chris is an obvious conclusion. Like, how can I not want to do this? That's the ideal scenario you want to get to. Sorry for the bad analogies today, guys, but I'm just trying something there. Um, anyhow, Brandy, any thoughts on that? Have you done a, a private group before? So I don't personally have a private group, but I have worked. Um, I, I'm on a team with another coach who um, specializes in infertility, and she has a group. Um, and one of the things that I found that really works there is really watching the type of questions that people in your group are asking. Um, because that's going to really tell you what kind of content they're looking for. So, um, Chris, you mentioned like doing some Facebook lives or YouTube videos, like that could be an opportunity where you could just say, well, I'm going to do, you know, every Friday, I'm going to cop on and do a live and it's a Q&A and ask me your questions. And you could like, you could have subjects for each of those lives based on the discussion or the questions that you're seeing in your group so that you're providing them with information and education, but then also not giving it away. So you may feel like you're repeating yourself over and over and over again, but sometimes people need to hear that information several times before it actually clicks and they're like, hey, I get this. Okay, I want to hop on a call with Chris and, and I want to learn more how to do some coaching with him. So. Um, you know, I think I've heard other coaches, successful coaches like Kendra and, and people like that say that, like you, you're going to feel like you're repeating yourself a lot. Um, but it sometimes takes people or your audience to hear that several times before it really starts to click. Um, and then they're ready to jump in. And maybe some of these people aren't quite ready yet to jump into a coaching program, but eventually they may be. So just keep giving them good co content, sharing your story listen to what they're asking for and see if you can give them some education on what they're asking for. Good stuff. Awesome. All right. Well, eight minutes left in the show, guys, and we've got another hand raise. We'll see if we can answer your question fully here. So 406 area code. What's your name, 406? Hi there. This is Avery. Hello, Avery. How are you? Doing well. How's things in your world? Great. Great. It's a, kind of a cloudy day in Hawaii, but pretty oh. good, I'd say. <laughs> oh, don't go there. <laughs> oh, that's, um, I'm teasing. I'm I glad you're in Hawaii. Question. Yeah, me too. Um, remember what your response was. Um, so Reed is always saying um, in the first 90 days of the program, of the protocol, uh, no sugar, no alcohol. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, when he says sugar, does that count? Is that only, like, refined sugars, um, or is it fruit sugar, carbs, um, or is it more, like, based on person to person? Um, yeah, I guess that's, that's it. Hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Good question. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, kind of a hard line there that we tow uh, on that. I think it's really good advice. Um, so I'm going to say that that um, the sugar there is going to be more on the refined sugar side. Um, but like you said, a little bit case by case. And so if you have um, other information on lab testing or based on symptoms there, um, that points to that they don't do well with any much sugars at all. So maybe there are a protein type and a metabolic type 
So a lot of even fruit sugar or honey or maple syrup or um, things like that, they may not do very well with, may not be beneficial. We might you know, extend that out and say, you know, limit the sugars at all, limit the, the sweet, sweetened carbohydrates caloric sweeteners. Maybe we need to limit those. That's possible. I think in a minimum, you pull out the white sugar, uh, 100%. I don't think that's good for really anybody. You know, here and there later on, yes. Um, I think there's some room for that, probably. We have to find what, you know, I have some pleasure in life, too, if that's what, something we like. But first 90 days, yeah, step the body to be successful. Um, and I would say that would be refined sugar there is the main thing. Um I think that's right. Brandy, is that what you're understanding? Yeah, I kind of also gauge like what the client is coming to us with. So if they're eating the standard American diet and they're eating like soda and, you know, lots of refined carbohydrates, they are going to struggle a little bit. So you may want to take some baby steps with them and maybe, you know, have them cut out one thing at a time so that you can go slowly or you may have the client that comes to you and they're already eating pretty, pretty clean, you know, and, you know, they're, they could take it or leave it. Like they don't really care if they have, you know, any sugar or honey or whatever the case may be. I think it just depends on the client that you're working with. And I mean, ideally we'd have them do it a hundred percent of the time, like all sugars, but it may not be feasible for everyone. So just gauge, you know, how your client is. And if it's going to overwhelm them to take out all sugars and have them constantly obsessively reading labels and stress them out, then take that into consideration as well. Mm-hmm. All right. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. Very good. That awesome. Everybody. Thank you. My question. Yeah. Awesome. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for calling in. Enjoy the weather. Thank you. Have a great day. <laughs> Thank <Thanks>. you. <laughs> Uh, and be ready a little bit for possibly um, a little <laughs> taking out sugar and not feeling very good, right? So a little bit of a healing crisis that occurs just by taking out bad stuff. That happens a lot. Coming off caffeine, sugar, gluten, um, it's not always, oh, I feel so much better. You could feel crummy for a few days or a week even because your body's coming off of that drug in a way. So um, be aware of that. Um, tell people that could happen. It's not a bad thing. It's probably a good sign. So. Uh, one more hand raise, and this area code looks very familiar, so I'm going to say hello to 858. Yeah, it's me. Hey, Brandy. Hey, so. hey, Reed. All right, we're doing good. Hey. Randy's here, too. Yeah, good show, good show. You guys um, right on right on target. Um, just on that sugar, you know, sugar is white death. I mean, it really is really bad for you. It's as addictive as cocaine, and it's not good for anybody. It's one of the few foods, as Bill Wolcott says, there's no one food that's right for everybody, but there are some things that are wrong for everybody, and sugar is one of them. It just it screws with uh, carbohydrate metabolism, you know, your um, insulin levels and things. And it just, people always just want to jump start a program, get, get off sugar and alcohol for 90 days. That was always part of our original plan. Um, and I just want to say as you're closing here that, uh, things are going well, and I'm really, really proud of folks out there actually doing the work and sticking to the FDN principles and ideals. And Brandon, you, you guys, you and Brandy and the whole, whole team, the whole crew, everybody's doing a fantastic job. I'm very proud of you guys. Well, thank, thank you, Reed. I'm glad you jumped on here. And I was feeling that too. I wanted to mention that at the beginning of the call. Um, we, we, we talk about, you know, a lot of these questions and try to help people. But I would say I'm super proud of our group. Like the work you guys are doing, I get to hear it with medical director consult calls on these Friday calls. We get to see it posted. Um, you guys are doing awesome. So this is, you know, some corrections, some support and some help. But man, we've got an amazing yeah. group. So proud of everyone. Yeah. I got one last thing because the clock's ticking here. We're going to have to go down. And this is, uh, you know, this coronavirus thing. I, tr- Trump, uh, President Trump is going to make an announcement in five or ten minutes from right now. My personal belief is gonna, he's going to shut the government down. He's going to, you know, basically send federal workers home with pay for a couple weeks. And, um, you know, I'm just really convinced that's his only move right now. In terms of handling this as an emergency and all the, you know, the sum total of what's actually happening with the coronavirus and what's happening politically with the coronavirus, that's what he's going to do. 
And so everybody, uh, hold tight. Do not be alarmed. You should definitely go out and buy some toilet paper. You know, make sure you've got <laughs> some necessities. But we're not going to run out of food. You know, the, the supply chains are all in good in good place. But there is going to be some panic because of it. And so that's just my impression. Um, no one, no one, you know, no one Trump and no one, you know, the, the, just how things are going. Um, th- that's what's going to happen. But do not we the absolute best defense for anything is a good offense. I don't care what game you're playing. And in the health game, in the health business, the best defense is a good offense. And that is D R E S S. You want to double down on eating right. Don't eat crap like sugar. And you want to get a good night's sleep. There's nothing better for your immune system than good rest. And not to mention the fact that you detoxify and all these sorts of stuff. You have to move your body and exercise as you well know. And then all these hidden stressors, the, the, the toxicity of the environment, you know, even, even just if you think about it, what what transmutes the coronavirus? It's a hidden stressor. Shaking hands, you know, um, keep your hands to yourself. I was told that in fifth grade all the time. <laughs> but 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 uh, you know what I mean? Like keep keep your hands yep. to yourself. Keep them washed. Don't sneeze on anyone. If you have any symptoms, sequester yourself. Matter of fact. You know, kids are going to be home from school. Like right, as soon as he shuts down the government, it's going to happen in ten minutes. He, uh, it, it, you know, all the schools are going to close. Everything. The states are going to follow suit if they haven't already. And um, everyone just, you know, chill, have a good time for a couple of weeks. You know, that would be my my best advice. So just just chill. Well, and we'll talk to you on the other side, guys. Awesome, Reed. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Brandon, for being on. Hey, uh, thanks, thanks, guys, for tuning in. And, uh, well, guys, we'll talk next week. Be safe, everyone. Have a great weekend.